Good morning. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 3 in your Bibles as we continue through our Bible in a year plan. Uh, We were in Exodus this week, if you're following along with us. If you're not following along with us yet in your bulletins, uh, there are the verses every week so you can follow along there. I've had a little bit of a sinus infection, so if you hear me sniffling and sneezing, don't worry about it. Exodus chapter 3, I want to read the text uh, and kind of get us in context a little bit, and let's pray. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold... The bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, And I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain." Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And the God said to Moses, I am who I am. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that We don't have to try and figure out who you are, what you want from us, where we're going. We can go to your word, Lord. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that's among us right now, guiding us, directing us, inside of us, leading us, encouraging us, comforting us. And I pray as we open your word, Lord, that you would lead us into all truth this morning. I pray that you would strengthen us us in the areas that we are weak. I pray that you would encourage us in the areas that we are discouraged. And Lord, I pray that there would just be a hope, a confident expectation that is planted deeply in our hearts as we hear and respond to you this morning, Lord, that you would show us that the future is not hopeless. And not just the future of heaven, but the future that we have here still remaining, Lord. Help us to press on that we may lay a hold of that for which you've laid a hold of us. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So here's the deal. Our our culture, and maybe it's something that's been going on for a long time, because Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, there's absolutely nothing new under the sun. But there's this victimhood mentality um, that is going through our culture and permeating absolutely everything. And it's kind of an interesting thing because Uh, we start to identify ourselves by the things that have happened to us bad in the past. And we identify ourselves in a way that the past now defines who I'm going to be and what I can accomplish in the future. And so what happens is because this event happened to me, I will never be able to enjoy life again. I'll never be able to accomplish anything again. I was talking to a guy the other day um, and he was convicted of first degree 
armed robbery where there's like assault, you know, hit somebody with a brick. Um, I don't want to tell this whole story, but the point is everybody told him when he went into prison, like, you're never going to be able to travel the world. You're never going to be, do, be able to do this. You're never going to be able to do that. All of a sudden, he's doing water wells all over the world. He's d- serving the Lord and doing all these different things, right? The world will tell you because of your past that there is no hope for your future. That's what the world will tell you. Because of your past, there is no hope for your future. But here's the thing. If you've gone through traumatic things and you've been the victim of abuse and you've been, the vic- you've been abandoned and all these different things in your life and you've been hurt, you are so prepped to be used mightily by God because every single one of these people as we walk through here, including Moses, had some of the most traumatic things ever happen to him. Moses was born in a time like just to keep this, this passage in context, Moses is born in a time where Pharaoh had command, commanded that all the midwives kill the babies. As soon as they realized it was a boy coming out of the Israel, Israelite woman, I got weird in my accent there, they would kill the baby. So he's born in this time of mass genocide, right? And his mom has to hide him. And when she can no longer hide him anymore, she puts him up for adoption. She doesn't know what's going to happen. She puts him down by Pharaoh's house where where the girls are going down to take a bath. So he's put up for adoption. So think about this story just for a second. Here's this kid that was born, should have been killed. And then his mom just puts him up for adoption. So that's already a bad start to life, right? You're just being raised by somebody else. You have no idea where you're going. And, and then he's raised up and, and he's going along. And Moses has this, in his heart, like he just cares about his people, right? He has this zeal for his people. And sometimes that's the problem of being young is your zeal comes out in ways that actually damages what God's destiny is for your life. And his zeal for his people, like he sees, he sees one of his fellow people getting pushed around and abused and taken advantage of. And he goes and he kills this Egyptian guy. I'm just kind of paraphrasing the first two chapters here. He goes and he kills this Egyptian guy. Well, murder back then is pretty much as serious as murder now. You kill somebody and it changes the whole course of your life. Now he is a convict, right? He's a felon. And what does he do? He doesn't want to go to prison. He doesn't want to, you know, by, if you shed man's blood by man's hand, your blood shall be shed, is the scriptures. And so instead of doing that, he runs away. So now here he is, an orphan, adopted child murderer, and he's getting up there in years in his life. And so now he runs away, and he finds himself out in Midian. And that's where we pick up this passage in Genesis chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. I I just want you to notice something right out of the gate. Moses wasn't tending his own flock. He hadn't built up a successful, what would that be, shepherding business? He hadn't built up a successful business. He was tending somebody else's flock. Moses is an old man. Dude's 80 years old at this point, and he still hasn't gone anywhere. He's been working for somebody else his entire life. Maybe when he was young, he had aspirations of accomplishing all these different things. One day, I'm going to have all these sheep, or I'm going to have all this stuff, or maybe one day I'm going to be leading in Egypt. I don't know what Moses was thinking, but I do know that every single one of us, when we're young, we have aspirations of doing something significant. We just have these aspirations, and slowly one thing, maybe it's bad decisions, maybe it's life circumstances, maybe it's abuse, maybe it's, I don't know what it is, but these things slowly start putting this idea in our head that that's never going to happen, and the future starts becoming hopeless. You know what's fascinating is like, in the beginning, like, have you ever seen a kid that doesn't have joy, like a little baby, maybe they cry a little bit and stuff, but they're just like joyful and they're happy and they're running around and they're playing. And then all of a sudden, a few years goes by and look, we end up like this. Have you noticed that? What happened to the joy and the running around other than the joints getting older? What happened to all that? All of a sudden, the the future just becomes more and more hopeless as we go. And here's Moses. I'm just trying to paint like the picture of where Moses is in in his head and his life here. Moses is tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So here's Moses, a shepherd, not even shepherding his own flock. He's still just a hireling, working for dad, in-law, 80 years old. And now he's out on the backside of the desert. He's not even just out in the desert. It's that you can't even see town from where he's at. He's on the backside of the desert. He's in the middle of nowhere. And literally, Horeb means desolation. 
Mountain of desolation. So in other words, when guys were out there, they got really far out there, and then they went farther, and they got on the backside, and they look, and there's this mountain. They're like, man, that place is desolate. Who would ever go there? Well, Moses was there. Moses was in this place of desolation, this place of dryness, this place where it's just like, I have just ended up here. Life got away from me, and now here I am in this dry desert place. Nobody around, nothing to my name. I'm out here with sheep. And here's Moses. And the angel, verse 2, of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. I think this is the most, like, fast, one of the more fascinating passages in the entire Bible, to me anyway. Moses is in the middle of nowhere, and God meets him there. Like, it's so funny because we think that, um, I don't think we'd ever say this out loud, but in so many ways, we really believe that God is so limited, that it's all dependent on what we do, how we position ourselves for God to meet us and to use us. You know, one thing that just like totally turns that up on its head is John the Baptist for me. John the Baptist, his mailing address was the wilderness, right? Like he's just out there in the middle of the wilderness and says that everybody came to him. Well, what I can't figure out is what kind of form of social media they had back then that everybody would just wander out into the desert. They didn't even have, like, they didn't even have navigation in their camel-drawn carriages or whatever they had back then. They didn't have anything, yet they go out there. It's weird. When God wants to do something, he can do it anywhere. Let me, let me just share from you from personal experience. I have a text for you. If I can find my text. So there I am. in the middle of nowhere. We fly into this airstrip and we land back there and we're hunting and there's one other camp on the airstrip and the weather just turned terrible, there's a blizzard. And we go back and we're like, we need to get, these guys had a tent, we didn't really have much of a tent, we're just getting miserable. So we're like, we're gonna go in there and we're just gonna introduce ourselves and see if we can sit in their tent. We could see some some smoke coming out of the top of the tent. And we go and we, you know, we're talking through the tent. Nobody can see each other yet. And Adam, who's hunting with me, walks in first. And then I walk in right behind him because they invite us in. And the guy goes, no way. He's like, limitless outdoors? <laughs> and so we start this relationship. Well, he texted me the other day, and we've become good friends since then. But here's the text from him. He said, okay, thanks, Justin. Um, yeah, this is it. I'm still just blown away on the way that we ran into each other. I was at a point with my anxiety with going on my trips where I was actually going to email you before that hunt in the back country. I'm not going to tell you where it was. This last year to see if you had ever heard of anyone getting so anxious about something that they love to do so much. Then two weeks later, whew, you walk into my tent. I've never been so shocked. Okay, so God cares about you, just like flat out. He doesn't just care about this guy more than he cares about you. So I thought it was interesting what he said, though. Like, have you ever heard of somebody being so anxious about something that they love so much that they don't even want to do it anymore? And he was going to reach out, and then God, here's what I believe, and you can believe whatever you want to. I believe God sent me over there to meet him. God will meet you. That was literally, that's as close to a wilderness deal as I can come up with for you as like a pure, actual, 100% factual example. Like God will meet you in the wilderness right where you are. And so here's Moses. Here's Moses out in the middle of the wilderness. This bush is on fire, but it's not consumed. And he's like, I'm going to turn aside and see this thing. I need to know what's going on here. But I want you to notice this. It wasn't until he turned aside that God spoke to him. 
One of the things that we see in our lives as we look back is how God was trying to get a hold of us for years and years. And you see all these little things that he was doing. And it's not until we turn aside and we turn face to face and we walk into the presence of God that we experience the power of God. And he starts to move in our lives. So here is Moses. And I've heard some people preach that maybe Moses had seen this over and over again. But he decided, like, now I'm going to turn aside. Like, maybe that bush was burning every time he went by. And he's like, huh? What's going on here? But now, he's, it says now he, he's going to turn aside and go check it out. Either way, it doesn't matter, but it wasn't until he turned aside that God spoke to him. And he says, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am, verse 5. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the so many sites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, all these guys. So here's the point. God shows up in his life, and we've got to contrast Moses' life up till now. Moses was beyond a nobody leading somebody else's sheep around in the backside of the desert in the most desolate place ever. And now God is going to ask him, God is going to give him the opportunity at a different future, one where he's going to lead over a million people out of captivity and into freedom. That's pretty significant. Can you imagine that kind of responsibility? After not really being responsible for anything, you're taking care of some other dude's sheep. You haven't accomplished anything with your life. And now in your later years, in your silver saints or silver chiefs or whatever it is, your dinosaur years, in your dinosaur years, God's going to do incredible. I know, I'm sorry. (laughs) It's a jestingly respectful way of saying it. I forget it. Think about this for a second. Moses had no future. The future was hopeless. There was nothing from a worldly standpoint that would indicate that Moses was ever going to be anything. There would have been 10,000 other people in line that you'd pick before Moses. In fact, as we continue through this this account in Exodus, we see that Moses says, I'm slow of speech. My mouth doesn't work. I've got to stutter. How am I going to to be eloquent? How am I going to deal with these politicians? How am I going to go in there and lead these people? Who's going to follow me? In fact, he says right here in Exodus chapter 3, Moses says to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the the children of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? And that is the most dangerous question that we can ever ask and dwell on because Satan will just get in your head. He's the great accuser. He's the one that that will rob, kill, and destroy at every opportunity. And you'll ask that question, who am I? Who am I that I could do this thing? When God shows up in a burning bush, it doesn't matter who you are. It matters who he is. It's not about who am I. It's about the great I am. It's not about if I am enough. It's about the great I am being enough. It's about him who holds the future saying, look, this is the plan that I have for you to walk in into the future. These are the good works. Ephesians chapter 2 says that he has prepared good works beforehand for us to walk through. And no matter what we hear, oh, this is cool. No matter what we do, we really can't mess that up beyond God's redemption. If he comes to you and says, look, I want you to do this. It doesn't matter what you've done up to this point. God's giving you something to do right now. And if he's okay with it, what authority out there matters besides God's authority? There's nobody higher than him. There's no family member that can say, well, yeah, but because of this and this and this, you can never do that. The world will tell you that your future is hopeless because of your past. That's the reality. Everybody's future, and and we're even guilty of it. Think about the people that you look at. We were watching a basketball game the other day, and Charlotte was like, I'm just going to throw my wife completely under the bus here. She was like, that kid's going to be in prison soon. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe true. But why are we speaking that over people's lives? It's so easy to sit in the stands and be like, ah, 
That person's going to be in prison. That person's going nowhere. That person will never accomplish anything. What if you came alongside somebody and you were like, you know what? My past was messed up. I'm seeing, and I'm, let's just speak in the context of people that have had a messed up past. Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like, right now, everything can change in a single moment. You could be walking along in the backside of the desert and all of a sudden God shows up to you and you say, here I am. And all of a sudden from that moment, absolutely everything changes. There is a different future. There's a hope-filled future. What if we were those kind of people that were speaking life over people? And even in saying that, some people are like, are you getting weird there, Justin? I, I don't know. Maybe I'm getting weird Am I, as I keep walking with the Lord. But I do see the power that what we say about people and what we say to people has on their life. And Moses, God tells Moses, what does God say to him? God doesn't say, hey, you're a piece of garbage. You're a murderer. You're never going to accomplish anything. He says, Moses, I've got something for you to do. And Moses says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh And that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. So God's response to him is, I will certainly be with you. I will certainly be with you. You know, um, there's a passage I love, and it's in uh, Romans chapter 4. And it's about faith. It's about righteousness that comes by faith. And it says this, verse 13. And I'm going to read a few verses to you and kind of commentate them. For the promise, this is about Abraham, the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but to also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Okay, so what we have going on here is that in order to have everything be assured, the assurance has to come from something bigger and better than ourselves because we're always going to fall flat. We're always going to come up short on these different things. Like you can promise things, but things happen in life and all of a sudden you're not able to perform on that. But God is always able to perform. So if he promises something, it's going to happen. And it's going to happen regardless of how many times you mess up. If he says it's going to happen, that that means that it's going to be by grace that it happens. And you have to have faith in this future that God promises. And we're going to get into some serious stuff here. You have to have faith. The only way you can move into a future that has hope in your life is if you have faith that God can take you there. It takes faith. Because looking at it statistically, there is no hope for your future. It's desolate. It's hopeless. You're getting older. You're wearing down. You're going to be less used, less valuable. Nobody's going to care about you. You're going to end up in a nursing home for 15 years and you're going to slowly die there. And then everybody's going to forget about you. That's the future the world will tell you. At best, maybe you go out in a blaze of glory and people remember you for a little while. But God says something different. He says this. In the presence, this is beautiful, of God, of him who believed, whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. That's kind of confusing wording. Let Let me say it like this. The future, a good future, does not exist for you yet. In your mind, maybe. It looks hopeless. There's too much that's gone on. There's too much that can't be rewound. But God, he says, speaks He gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. God says, look, Moses, you're going to lead my people out of Egypt. You're going to do it. That's what's going to happen. That didn't exist yet. That wasn't even a a flicker in Moses' mind. That didn't exist. And I wonder how many of us have been shown things by God and he shows you, you're going to, I want you to do this. Or maybe he asks you to do something and he's like, he's asking you to do this incredible thing. And you're just like, that doesn't exist. That can't exist. 
you don't understand. You've asked the wrong guy. Again, it's not about who you are. It's about who God is. It's not, am I enough? It's about the great I am being more than enough. He is with us. And you have to walk into the future. You have to walk into it by faith. There's no way because it doesn't make sense on paper. It doesn't make sense that you'd ever be able to do it. And if you're not dead yet, if you're not dead yet, you're not done. I love what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. He says, not that I have already attained, this is verse 12, or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also has laid a hold of me. Just stop right there. God has laid a hold of you for a reason. God has something for you to do. Are you going to grab a hold of it or are you going to let everything pull you away from it? Are you going to grab a hold of the future that God offers you or are you going to just forfeit it? Are you going to give it up? I'm not good enough. I'm not this. I have too much baggage in the past. I am not. I'm not. I, 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 me, me, me. Ha, ha, ha. Do you realize in that moment, Christian, that you have made everything about you and what you can do. And you know what? You can do nothing. But then Paul says in Philippians 4, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. What is that pertaining to? That's pertaining to the mission of God. Not necessarily dunk a ball like Asher Williams or whatever. But it could be that too if you're glorifying God in everything that you're doing. Man, he does this. He shows up in every which way supernaturally to reach people. And he'll reach people through everything. If you dedicate your life to God, if you dedicate your hobbies to God, God will do incredible things through it. There was a time in my life um, where we had been making really good money and then we lost absolutely everything that we'd ever been after. We went from making between two and 300000 a year very consistently down to $18,000 a year. And I remember thinking, I am never going to get to do any of these things that I used to get to do anymore. I'm never going to get to go and hunt in different places. And for years, it was that way. It was this wilderness season where the future totally looked hopeless. Why do you think people kill themselves? I have a friend calls me the other day. Girlfriend. Blew her head off. Why do people do that? Well, because they don't think that the future has any hope, right? Why else would you do it? There's no hope that anything's going to change. Life has been terrible in this moment. And sometimes that's for a day. Sometimes that's for a week, a year. Like your whole life has been terrible up to this point. And so what you do is you look forward to the future and you're like, the future is hopeless. So what do I even need to be around for? It's going to be more of this? I don't need that in my life. This is how it happens. This is the real deal. So much of how we engage the world depends on our view of the future and if it has hope in it or not. Even in the hardest times. So Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11, the context here is God saying after you've spent 70 years in Babylon because of the sin, because of your rebellion. So there's times where you go through extended periods of time. You know, sometimes we want things to change in a moment, but God often deals in decades and centuries. So that's kind of hard. Right? Sometimes you walk in these things for 40 years, right? Before God changes everything. But here's, the, here's what he says. He says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a, ho- and a hope. Here's the thing. You can't obtain a better future by working harder. You can't obtain a hope-filled future by working harder. It has to be given to you, and it can only be given by God. And to have something given to you like that, it requires that you accept it by faith. And so here's Moses. At this point in his life, nothing has gone right up to this point in his life. And God tells him, I want you to go and lead my people out of bondage and into freedom. That's what I want you to do. I want you to take them out of bondage and lead them into freedom. And Moses gives him every excuse in the book of why he can't do it. And God still says, this is the future I have for you. Are you going to accept it or are you not going to accept it? There is a hope-filled 
future for each of us in Jesus Christ. And I don't know where everybody is today. The reality is I think there's in every one of our lives, no matter how far we've run, no matter how far we've gone, I think that there's a reality that like there's things that are still holding us back. Just like Moses, when God shows up and says, this is what I want to do in your life. This is where I want to take you. This is what I want you to accomplish. I have good works for you, Moses. I have a future for you. There's a hope-filled future. You're not just going to sit out here and die in the backside of the desert. I'm sure that there's many of us in here right now that feel like we're in the backside of the desert. And we're looking forward and we're just like, how is the future ever going to be good without the spouse that I loved by my side anymore? How is that future going to be good? How could God ever resurrect it? I don't know how God can resurrect it. Like, so many people want the answers from me. I don't have all the answers, but I know God has them. We don't lean on people. We lean on God. We don't press into people. We press into God. God's the one who has the future and the hope. I don't have your future and your hope. I mean, I can give you some ideas of what you could do. I could tell you and I can inspire you that, like, there is a future out there and that God is working all things together for good. The good, the bad, and the ugly, he's working it all together for the good of those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. That's what God is doing. And if you're sitting here and you believe that the future is hopeless, you are saying, you might not think it this way, but you are saying that God is not working all this together for good. And then you start resenting God, like how could you take this away from me? And then you start hating God and you go from being somebody who's walking in the counsel of the ungodly to standing in the path of sinners to sitting in the seat of the scornful. And before you know it, you're this bitter old person and you're just like, eh, and you've been baptized in lemon juice. And there's no hope for a better future. But there is. Look I, look, I look at Roy and Margaret. Look the joy on your faces all the time. You might say that your marriage is too far gone because of things that have happened. There's no hope for a future. How could it ever be fixed? Do you know what they've done? You know what they've done? How could it ever be fixed? How could there ever be a, how could there be a future where we're happily married again? I don't know. When I look at it, I'm like, yeah, shoot the guy. That's what my wife would do. That's my counsel to you. I'm a, ter- I'm a terrible biblical counselor. <laughs> don't come to me for advice. I don't know how your marriage could get better. I also don't know how... God could part the Red Sea. Yeah, your marriage is just a big deal. The Red Sea was nothing. I don't know how God can fix a relationship. I also don't know how he knocked down the walls of Jericho. I don't know how he stopped the Jordan River. I don't know how he paid, like we could talk about and act like we know how he paid for all the sin. Yeah, he sent Jesus' his son to die in our place, but he poured all the sin of the world, all of our sin out on him and paid it in full and then he beat death. I don't understand all the intricacies of that, but I know he did it. And so, yeah, I don't know how God's going to fix your marriage. I don't know how God's going to heal you of the abuse in the past. I don't know how all that's going to work, but I know that God can do it. But you have to walk into it by faith that he can. Otherwise, when you look at it on paper, it's like, yeah, they did this, this, and this, and I have this, this, and this in my past, and yeah, I'm a murderer, and yeah, I'm an adulterer, and yeah, I stole this, and yeah, I have no future ahead. And if you look at it like that, you sure as heck don't. It takes faith. It takes faith that God is bigger than you, that God is more capable than you, that God can open doors that no man can shut, and he can shut doors that no man can open. It takes faith that God can part the Red Sea and knock down walls. It takes faith that there is a future that is better than what the world says is out there for us. You have to walk in faith in that. Otherwise, Moses could have walked away and gone nowhere in his life. He could have gone back to tending sheep. And here's the reality, is God is not gonna force you to do anything. And I'm telling you right now, there are opportunities in your life where God is going to, just like David, walked out there to give bread and cheese to the captains of the army, and there was Goliath. And he had the choice to make in that moment. Am I going to face Goliath, or am I just going to do what I was out here to do? And you have opportunities. Just because your family has been some way, You don't have to be a druggie. You don't have to be a piece of garbage. You don't have to end up in jail. I remember when I was in jail, and that might be a shocker for some of you. 
Not really. <laughs> it was a really innocent thing. I just slashed some tires on a fishing game truck. Nothing. It was nothing bad. I remember them telling me, you're going to be in here all the time now. That's what everybody in the jail told me. And I remember thinking, you guys have lost your minds. I don't want anything to do with this place. Like when my freedom was taken away, I was like. <laughs> but those voices, the world, this is who you are now. You're always going to be this. Your dad was a piece of garbage. Your mom was a piece of garbage. You were a druggie. You're always going to be a druggie. You're a convict. That's, that's your new identity. My identity is not convict. My identity is not druggie. I've done all these different... I, I, I don't know. I just did county jail, so I don't know if I'm an actual convict. But I was convicted. And it was a long time ago. This was like two months ago. So it's not... <laughs> I'm I was 18. I was 18. <laughs> I don't remember. Besides that, it was a long time ago. And what is it? I didn't do it. have no idea what you're talking about. Besides, it was a long time ago. Um, whose voice are you listening to? When it comes to your future, whose voice are you listening to? That's my last question for the day. When it comes to your future, whose voice are you listening to? Maybe a doctor tells you, well, your diagnosis is hopeless. And maybe it might be. I don't know. Maybe that's how God takes you home. He does that sometimes. But also, sometimes, God does miraculous healing. Whose voice are you listening to? Are you giving up? It's like, well, they told me I only have six months to live, so I'm just going to sit here until I die and just stare at the wall. Whose voice are you listening to? Are you listening to those that are trying to pull you back down? I, I heard this story. I, I want to share this with you really quick. There was, and I know it's true because I do it with crawdads. There's this old man walking up the docks one day and he has a bucket full of crabs. And a little boy walks by him and he's like, sir, why don't you have a lid on that bucket? Aren't you worried that the crabs are going to get out? And he said, no, not at all. Because every time one starts to get out, the other ones pull them down. Whose voice are you listening to? The crabs that are in the bucket that you're trying to crawl out of? No, 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 you can't get out and they grab a hold of you and they try to pull you back down. Whose voice are you listening to? You can always tell the voice of God and the voice of the devil because the devil always wants to pull you down. And we have to hear the voice of the devil even in our friends. You remember Peter? In Matthew chapter 16, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. He has this major epiphany moment where he sees Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. And then in the next sentence, Peter says, don't go to the cross. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. We have to learn to hear the voice of God through our friends, but also to learn to hear the voice of the enemy through our friends. Because sometimes even our best friends who love us the most speak for both. Here's a good way to know it if they're pulling you back down, if God gives you a God dream, like to expand his kingdom, I'll never forget. Years ago, I had this dream that I would stand in front of a stadium full of people and preach. And it was just crazy. This is before I was even a preacher. I just kept having this dream over and over again that, that was going to happen. And everybody, because of the things that I'd done, they're like, ah, oh, you're not, I don't even know if you're qualified to be a pastor. How is that ever going to happen? And then one day in 2019, I speak in front of a stadium full of people. And 360-something guys give their life to the Lord. But everybody will tell you, if you hear the people saying, no, 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 oh, you shouldn't do that. If God's calling you to something, oh, you know, actually, if you go over to Africa, it's pretty dangerous. Like, your family might get sick. They might die. But if God's calling you to it, what does it matter? God's going to always pull you up. God's voice, God's words are always going to pull you up. God's words spoken through other people, they're going to edify, they're going to build you up. Do you understand? And there's like a huge doctrine on this sucker. When God is moving, when God is working in your life, like anything that you've built up that is not of God, he's going to level that. But anything of God, he's going to just build you up. That's what God wants to do. He wants to build up not just you individually, but his church 
to edify the church. That is the purpose of pastors and preachers and teachers and evangelists and apostles. That is the purpose of us is to build up the church. So God's words are always going to draw you up. Gosh, I could just go on for hours about this. I'm sorry. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid a hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Satan is down in hell and he's trying to pull everybody down there. The upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Advice from Satan and the world is always going to pull you down. Those are the crabs in the bucket. God is the one who wants to pull you up and out. And my prayer over everybody is that you'd be able to discern the two. The future, future and walking into it is determined in whose voice you listen to. The end is where you stop. You don't know what God's going to do in the 11th hour. You don't know if God's going to show up. When Moses was down on that point, that's a peninsula down there off for the Red Sea, for those of you that don't know. This whole Red Sea crossing deal, that's a peninsula down there. And they had mountains to the north of them. And they had the world's most sophisticated, advanced, and powerful army on their heels. They had nowhere to go. And at the last moment, by faith, Moses turns, faces the sea, lifts his staff, and God starts parting the sea. So yeah, you can follow through. You can get a divorce because it's easiest. Because you have no hope in a future. What you really don't have hope in is that God is powerful enough to to fix it. That's what you really don't have hope in. But my God tells me that he has plans to prosper us as his people. To give us a future, and a hope. It does not matter what you've done up to this point. It matters what you do now. And I don't know what opportunities God has put in front of you, but don't listen to anybody's voice that tells you that you can't be a part of doing those. If God has prepared the work for you and he's called you to it, then nobody on this earth has the authority to stop you. You gotta walk into it and you gotta walk into it by faith. Just like Moses did. He was slow of speech, abandoned, murderer, no qualifications to lead over a million people out and into freedom. Who knows how many people God will use you to lead into freedom if you'll simply respond and believe that God has a plan for your life. Amen? Lord, I thank you for my friends, and I pray, Lord, I pray that there wouldn't be a spirit of cynicism on us as we hear that. It's just like, yeah, that's great for somebody else, but not my life. Lord, I pray against that in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that you would radically liberate people from the bondage of Satan and the lies of Satan and the crabs in the bucket that are pulling them down, Lord. I pray that you would show them that there is a hope for their future, that they don't have to end up like everybody else in their family ended up. They don't have to end up like that marriage ended up. They don't have to end up like that guy ended up, but that they can end up with an incredible testimony of your faithfulness and the future that you have for them. Lord, I pray that they would walk in that by faith. I pray, Lord, that you would just be speaking individually to my friends right now and showing them, showing them that all things are possible through you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.